Good evening, everybody. Um, this is the Board of Selectmen's meeting on April 7th. Um, we're running it a little bit late because if anyone that was watching, they saw that it was playing last week's meeting, and now we're live on this me week's meeting. Seth, thank you for running over to the high school and fixing the problem. Um, so this is the second uh, meeting in a row that we're doing mostly remotely access. Um, Karen Canfield and myself are here, and Moore Curran, Sean Harris, and Karen Conley are all dialed in and on the phone. Um, also in the room, Michelle Segezi is handling the phones. Lorraine Devon is doing the minutes and directing us. Jim, Seth in the back, and Nancy Holt in the other side. So we are all practicing social distancing, and we hope you all are doing the same thing. Um, um, and I will just make a quick comment on, on that. I think, uh, you know, it's crazy times, and, um, uh, you know, we're all trying to get what we can get done, and um, you know, I want to applaud our town hall employees and, and the police department and everybody there. They're all doing a great job, and Jim's doing a great job managing everybody and making sure that we're getting everything done and keeping people separated um, and also making sure that we can still keep our operations going if someone does get sick. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to thank all the citizens of the town. You know, on the weekends, we all go out for walks, and I notice that everybody's trying to um, listen to all the, the guidance that we're getting and, and keeping social distancing. And there's a few areas of town where we're a little bit concerned about, but Jim will talk about those in his report today. Um, but the better we do now, the shorter this whole period will be. So um, please pay attention to the rules we put in place. Please have patience through these times, and, um, and it will be done a lot quicker than, than if we don't. So... Um, anything to add to that, Karen? Nope. I'm sure Jim will cover yeah. most of the things Good. in his report. All right. So before we get into that, I just, um, before I have, well, why don't I call the meeting to order and ask for an acceptance of the agenda? So moved. And, and all the votes tonight will be roll, roll call votes because everyone's not in the room. Second by... Um, I moved. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? And we'll do a roll Aye. call. Karen Connolly, aye. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Great. Okay, so we're now in session. Um, and I just want to go over very quickly how you can participate in the meeting this evening. So if you do wish to participate, um, here's some numbers that you can call, and then Michelle will kind of coordinate you getting on on the air to speak or um, you know to join the conversation so the phone numbers that you would call are 425-436-6308 um, or you can call 425-436-6338 or you can also call 425-436-6300 so the last four digits are 6308, 6338, or 6300. And then there's an access code you have to push, and that's 817-651-POUND. <coughs> I'll say that one more time. 817-651-POUND. And then you'll come to the switchboard, and Michelle will get you in a queue, and then you can um, speak from there. Um, one last comment before we go to the town administrator's report is, just know that during this time period when the meetings are a little bit, uh, first of all, they're not as open to the public as, as they have been in the past, the topics that we're dealing with are probably just the stuff that we need to get done. Um, any issues that are um, bigger picture issues or pe pe issues that are more um, relevant to having participation, we're not going to make any decisions on any of that stuff until this whole thing passes and the public can come in and participate as they usually do. Um, a good example of that is last week when we had uh, some a report submitted to us on the wind turbine. We had some people call in and participate, but we realized that people that wanted to participate couldn't. So we're just going to put any decisions on that off until we can have a meeting where everyone can be here. So, um, so just know that that's our kind of our mo until we get through this time period. That being said. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim, and he can do the report of the town administrator. Sure. Thank you. Try to be as brief as possible. Let's start with the COVID-19 update. As a video, yesterday morning, we had 38 cases of COVID-19 in Situate. Uh, as of last night, we had 41, three more cases yesterday. No additional cases today, so we still stand at 41 cases. Um, so I think that's good. We see that starting to level off. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we have had one death in situate. 
I was an elderly resident with underlying health conditions. Uh, it doesn't make it any better, but um, we have had our first death. The next 10 days are going to be the surge. This is where it's going to be bad. The numbers are going to jump across the state, across the country. This is when we need you to stay home. We need you to social distance. Uh, we're receiving calls in the office about people worried that people aren't social distancing, that people are congregating, particularly at the Lighthouse. Um, I went out to the Lighthouse yesterday and today looking. The parking lot is crowded, but I think for the most part, people are social distancing. The same down at the Driftway Park. The parking lot is crowded, but it looks like people are maintaining their social distance. Uh, some people called and said no one's wearing their masks. Uh, that is guidance. We cannot force anybody to wear a mask. Uh, if, you, if you're outside and you're social distancing, there is some uh, discussion whether you even need one, but we can't make people wear masks. If you go into a store, you should probably wear a mask, probably wear gloves, get in and get out. But again, social distancing is important. Uh, to try to help alleviate at least some of the congestion down at Driftway Park, we've opened the golf club course back up, two walkers. Um, there are no pets allowed. We are getting the golf course ready to open it at some point. Uh, so we're not going to let pets out there, dogs, anything that can make a mess of the course or damage the course. You need to stay on the pass. If there's no pass, stay in the rough. Maintain your social distancing and pick up any trash. Please don't litter on the course. Be aware the course is undergoing maintenance. So you need to be aware that there are going to be maintenance vehicles, there are going to be lawnmowers, there are going to be little trucks and stuff going around. So be aware that they're there and keep an eye out uh, when you're walking so you don't interfere or get hit by one of those vehicles. But we're going to open it. We're going to keep an eye on all these places. We will continue to monitor them. Uh, I hate to say this, but the good thing is we will have bad weather for the next couple of days, which will drive down people congregating in those places. Uh, but we will monitor all these spots, and if at any point the health director feels that there is an issue with people congregating and not social distancing, then we will close those spots down. Uh, but right now, I think people are doing a very good job of social distancing. You do see people together. It's usually a family. Um, there's really no point in social distancing with them when you're walking, when you're living in the same house with them. So, uh, But I think people are doing that and, and doing well. Uh, as a caveat to that, um, especially in the next two weeks, the Situate Water Department is starting to get requests for water service turns on. Uh, we will not be turning on water services at this point until the emergency abates at some point. Uh, the Water Department's job is to provide water and fire protection to the town of Situate. There are over 500 water services that can be turned on over the spring as people move back hmm. or activate their summer houses. That's potentially 500 instances where one of our employees can go out and be exposed to the virus. Um, we are working with reduced staff right now, so we don't actually have enough people to send out. And the people that we have are very highly trained. They have licensed to distribute the water. If those people get sick, if too many of them get sick, then we could have a problem with operating our treatment plan. So we are keeping those people in, away from the public, especially during the next two weeks of the surge. We're keeping everybody's name. We're making a list. And when the health department says, okay, we think it's safe to let people start going and turn those on, we will start turning them on on the basis of the list when they called in. Uh, but it's really important that we keep our water department employees healthy. I know we talk about our first responders. We talk about the police. We talk about the fire. But we only have a certain number of, of people who can run that treatment plant. And if they get sick, we do have contingency plans that involve getting water from other towns. But that is really not an optimal solution. We don't want to have to do that. So we're really going out of our way to make sure that these guys and women are, are safe and protected and we have a critical amount of employees to make sure we have safe water and sufficient water for the entire town. Uh, <laughs> Along the same lines, and I said this yesterday, please be kind to our sewer department. Uh, we had a blockage on the driftway on Sunday. They went out and they, they unblocked it, and it was so-called disposable wipes. They're not disposable. They're not good for the sewer system. They're not good for your septic system. Please keep them out of the sewer system so we don't have to send guys out to clear those blockages. Uh, construction, we talked about that. Uh, we do have ongoing construction projects. We have asked the state for guidance on those projects. We have still not received the guidance from the state as to whether those projects can continue or not. Um, the state has given us guidelines as to what must happen, not just for our projects, but for any project going on. Uh, and we will have the Board of Health and our other agents go out and make sure that any project that is operating is meeting the guidelines for COVID-19 while doing construction. So that'll be Toll Brothers and all those other places. They must be in compliance with these guidelines or they have to stop operations. 
In other construction news, we have postponed the coal parkway piling project uh, until after the boating season. We had several conversations with the contractor, and he could not guarantee that he would be able to get it ready for the start of the boating season, nor could he guarantee when it would be ready after the boating season started. Um, there are too many questions about what happens if his crews get sick, what happens if the materials and the equipment is delayed or can't be shipped or can't be fabricated. So we just felt it's in the best interest of everybody to say, no, we're not going to do this. The old marina will go back. It's perfectly functional. We'll put the old marina in, and then in the fall, he'll be able to do the coal parkway uh, and the other marina and have plenty of time to get them done for the fall boating season. I do want to end on a, on a happy note, I think. Um, as the board is aware, at your last meeting, you ratified my selection of Mark Thompson as the next chief of police for the town of Situate. Uh, by making Mark the chief, we have a vacancy in the deputy chief's position. We did an assessment center for the deputy chief's position at the same time we did the assessment for Mark's position. Uh, after re reviewing the scores and meeting with the candidates, Deputy Thompson, or Chief Elect Thompson, or however you want to refer to him at this point, uh, has recommended to me that Lieutenant Allison Steverman fill the position of deputy chief of the Situate Police Department. And I am pleased to announce to the board tonight that I will be accepting Mark's recommendation and appointing Lieutenant Steven as Deputy Chief effective June 5th of 2020. So congratulations to Lieutenant Steven. She's been on the department, uh, I believe, since 2003, has worked her way up, and she's very deserving of this promotion and will do an outstanding job as Deputy Chief. So now we have a Lieutenant's vacancy, and we will be setting up assessment centers for the Lieutenant's position. But we have filled the two top spots, and they'll be ready to go when Chief Stewart retires in June. So congratulations again. Uh, to Deputy Chief Elect uh, Lieutenant uh, Allison Steverman. That's all I have for tonight. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, do, I'll, I'll just go around the room. Sean, do you have anything for uh, Jim or any comments? Yes, I do. Jim, are we <coughs> sure that the cost for the Marina project being delayed, that, and I really couldn't hear you that well, that the cost won't go up? As of right now, no. Contractor. As of right now, the contractor is, is holding to his contract. Okay. All right. Are you comfortable with that? Well, all right. How do I, yeah. All right. We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. All right. Yeah, a lot, a lot can happen between now and then, right. Sean. That was my... You know, a lot could happen now. We don't know what's going to happen, but right now he's holding to the contract, and we're going to hold him to that. All right. Great. That was my only question. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Um, Maura, do you have any questions or comments? I do to follow up uh, with Sean. Thank you, Tony. Um, wasn't the uh, piling project partially funded through the Seaport, ad a Seaport Advisory Grant? And do we have any time constraints, or do we have to notify them of the delay? Steve has already taken care of that, and then they are expecting that from most of their contracts for this spring. So they're fine. Okay. That was all I had, Mr. Chair. Uh, Karen Conley, any questions? Um, no questions, but congratulations to Lieutenant Steverman, well-deserved. And if I could add to what Jim had to say about Lighthouse Point, there are plenty of other places for people to walk, including North Situate Village all the way down to Minot, which is beautiful. Um, we have plenty of places, conservation areas, if you like wood, walk from the harbor up to first and second cliffs. You can walk from the Driftway Park up to third cliff. <laughs> So I think to give everyone on Lighthouse Point a little bit of a, a break, but um, there are plenty of places to walk, and I just hope that people think about it. That's it. Thanks. Karen? Uh, just wanted to note one thing um, at the beginning of the meeting is that um, if you are looking for masks, um, we're not wearing them because you wouldn't be able to hear us right now, um, you can contact the sandshelps.org site. Um, there have been donations of masks made to them that are available, um, so you can reach out to them. And also they wanted uh, folks to know that there's a, um, special assistance for veterans um, that they are coordinating through that site as well for food, medicine, whatever the vets need. So those two things are, are up and running, and I just wanted to make note of that, sir. Great. Um, I'll just uh, reiterate a couple things. One, um, on the golf course, uh, part of what Karen Conley mentioned, um, you know, that is a, a big, wide open space, and our, uh, our thoughts behind opening that up are to give people other places to walk. 
So it sh should hopefully alleviate some of the parking that's over at Cole Parkway and maybe alleviate some of the people having to go down to um, you know, the lighthouse, which is a beautiful walk as well. So um, we will have to tell you though, I, I, I know Jim said it a second ago, I wanna reiterate that there can't be pets on there and even though you may be used to it because of all the work and money that goes into getting the greens in the condition that they are for the golf course to run, um, we can't afford having um, animals going in there and destroying it during this time of work. So um, please adhere to that so we don't have to um, close that facility up. Um, and then lastly, just a huge congratulations to Lieutenant Steverman. Um, great asset to the force. We'll do a great job as Deputy Chief and um, you know, well-deserved. So thank you for your service. Um, great. Well, we'll move along to our first item of the evening, which is a public hearing and a discussion vote on a liquor license transfer. Um, and this is for Board 143. Sure. So on the line, do we have Mark? Michelle? Yes. Yeah, Carrie. And Carrie. And Carrie. Hi, how are you guys? Good, how are you? Good. Um, we met with you maybe a month ago and discussed this, and it yeah. seems like it's been worked out. If you want to just give us a quick overview, yeah. and then we can discuss. We'll have qu any questions for you. Well, we reached out to Tracy, and we had good conversation, and we came to an agreement to buy the full liquor license. Um, so that we can get the store up and running as soon as possible. Great. And here we are. <laughs> Good. So you're happy with it? You, you've you come to an agreement on yes. on a purchase price for the liquor license, and you are good to go? Yes. Good. I'm glad you guys were able to work it out. Tracy's on the line as well. Okay. Yeah. Tracy, do you have any comments? I do not. I'm excited that we were able to come to an agreement and... Looking forward to moving forward. Good. So are we. I'm going to open it up to the selectmen that aren't in the room first. Sean, do you have any questions or comments? I couldn't agree more, Kerry. Um, I'm just happy for both you guys. Um, I think it was a win-win situation for all. Really look forward to um, visiting your store, and I wish you the best of luck. Um, Thank you so much. Maura? You're, you're welcome. Um, thank you, Tony. Uh, hi, Carrie. I was not at the original meeting, but I, I did uh, review some of the minutes, so I am glad that everything worked out between the two different parties. Uh, just one question, because I wasn't at that meeting, um, and with this new endeavor, will you be ensuring, what steps are you going to ensure to make sure that you have TIP certified folks on hand? Um, we're going to just make sure that anyone there, yeah, we're going to follow all the guidelines. Um, you know, initially I think it'll be just me and my husband, and um, we have one other person hopefully we'll take on board who has the same kind of background. So in that regard, we'll be all set. Okay, and you, you and your husband are already TIP certified? No, but we will be. Okay. I'll be signing on the liquor license policy for the town upon your <clears throat> Okay. So that they can make sure they adhere to it. We have several months. Great. Okay. So we'll get the policies out to you so you know what has to be done. And then, as Morris said, um, you know, we would request you to be TIP certified. Um, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, Karen Conley? Just want to say I'm very happy the parties came to an agreement. Thank you. And best wishes to all. Thank Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen Canfield. Um, how? Just a question. Um, I don't know who would know this answer. How long does it take before the, will it become effective immediately? No. How long does the transfer take uh, to process? And it takes thirty to thirty to ninety days. Okay. Um, and in theory, if we're still in an emergency declaration at the state, um, then they, once they, the transfer is complete, they'll be able to do curbside sale. I mean, this is a package store. No, package stores can do that. Yeah, they can. They yeah. can. They can, they can bring oh, it out curbside. Curbside. Curb yeah. That'll be their business decision. Right. right. But yeah. it'll under the emergency package, they will be able to quote under you know, open underneath. The, the current guidelines once that's transferred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. I believe so. 
right? No, we'd like to see up and running as fast as you can. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. All right. Just a new world. <laughs> Great. Um, and hold on, my computer is not cooperating. Good. So yeah, I'm glad it got worked out. I think it's a great location and uh, you guys seem um, uh, really excited about moving. So without further ado, I'll have a motion and we'll um, get this passed, hopefully. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the transfer of an all kinds of alcoholic beverages package store license from Stillwater's Wine and Gourmet to Board 143 LLC located at 776 Country Way with business hours Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. and Sunday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Q and A. Oh. And I will do a roll call vote. But this. we're gonna. Oh, Should we do the So I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Is there anyone online that has any questions or comments? Well. What I'll do is if there if there is anyone else, which there most likely will not be, I see Mark and Tracy, but we should go into a QA and just and okay. just see. Okay. So anyone that's watching, you can either call Q and A session has started. Exactly. This okay. would be when they could dial right. in, press star six. So I'll give you the number again real quick in case you have because this is a as a Michelle pointed out, a public hearing. So the number you dial right now is four two five four three six six three oh eight. You push in one eight seven six five one pound. Oh, say that again. I'll say that again. <laughs> eight one seven six five one pound. Okay. It doesn't look like anyone is has any further discussion on this. So we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Great. That's 5-0. It's a unanimous vote. The session is over. <laughs> so that passes unanimously. Congratulations and best of luck. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Best of luck to you. Love. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So we'll move on to the next item, which is a discussion vote for some uh, interfund borrowing for multiple projects. And uh, Pam, the uh, treasurer and collector, is not here, but Nancy is going to um, discuss it in her place. Good evening. Uh, normally, at this time of the year, we would be coming to you with a bond anticipation note, but due to the uh, circumstances that are happening in the world right now, the bond market is not very receptive to any municipal issues. So we need to do another interfund borrowing to meet our obligations for the next 30 days. And then uh, hopefully, sometime in May, we'll come back before you, Pam and I, with a bond anticipation note. There are three items that we're asking that the board would approve for interfund borrowing. Uh, first would be $500,000 for the Senior Center and Veterans Memorial Gym Rehabilitation. Uh, the original uh, interfund borrow from July of 2019 for $872,500 has been exhausted. $600,000 for the athletic fields, um, which are behind this building. Uh, the million dollars that was previously borrowed, and this would be the CPC portion of that project. Uh, also has been predominantly exhausted and we need additional funds to pay an uh, invoice that is expected to be uh, submitted to us for the next seven days. And then the final one is the Cedar Point uh, I, I project that had additional uh, design work for the alternative system and we are looking for $100,000 so that we would be able to move forward with it, that design. We're not in Jeopardy of not being able to, but we expect more invoices to come forward. Uh, that would uh, bring our total up to interfund borrowing of four million five hundred and two thousand, which is just below our limit, um, which is the balance of the stabilization fund. And that's what we're seeking from you right now. And hopefully, we'll be able to come back to you in about two meetings or so with a bond anticipation note that would bring all of these um, current with market funds. Great. So uh, clearly, those are three projects are underway and, and need the resources. It does, as you said, put us right up against the cap of our ability to borrow anymore. So what would be the next step in an emergency? Well, we need to go to market. Okay. Um, right now, we've been trying to go to market since um, March. And well, I know it's only last month, it's been a long month. 
uh, and we, there's just no appetite. And the other issue is uh, people are bringing things to market. They're not selling. They can't even get negotiated sales. And even though the Fed dropped the rate, uh, the municipal rate went up. So we don't want to come to market at a premium price uh, if we don't have to. So hopefully this will get us the rest of the way. I, if we can't borrow or we continue to have issues, um, I will come back before you in any of the interfund borrowing we've already done. Maybe we'll shift it around. We have some funds on the general fund portion of the athletic fields that haven't been used yet, and we could move that over depending on how bills come in. It depends month to month. If they're working on the turf, that's general fund. If they're working on something else, it's CPC uh, portion, and then there are other pots that can come into play as well. And this is just a band that we're going to borrow for anyways, right? Yeah, we would replace it at this time of the year anyways with a band. Right, so that's a short-term instrument anyway, so it would be... Yeah. Even if we had to pay a premium, it wouldn't be the and end of the world. And if we knew that was what was going to occur, we would make it as short as possible. We'd make it a 30 or 60 day ban to get us outside of the fiscal year. And that's, uh, Pam and I have a conference call on Thursday with our financial advisors to see what our options are. Normally we borrow in six month increments, but if, if the market is still that looking that negative when we go when we are going out, we certainly don't want to do that. Okay. Um, Sean, do you have any questions? No, no, I do not. Maura? Uh, yes, Nancy, what is our stabilization balance right now? Uh, balance of the stabilization fund is, bear with me for one sec, $4,553,583. Okay. That's all I have right now. Okay. Karen Conley? Karen Conley, do you have any questions? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my question is, if any of these projects are being put on hold, um, are we borrowing this money in anticipation of that we don't know when we'll be able to actually jumpstart them, so we want to have the money... Or do we already owe this money? No, we, we haven't. We're, we're essentially taking it from ourselves right now to pay bills that are expected to come in. And I, I assume that right. would last us for a period of, bills coming in for a period of time. At least 30 days. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so interfund borrowing means we're borrowing it from ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Karen? Just um, a question about process. Is um, the board, um, the public building committee, still meeting remotely to review um, any projects? Any in, they are? N Nancy's nodding. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, just so people know that they're charged with construction projects, making sure that somebody's looking, besides Nancy, who does a great job, looking carefully at the, um, the bills and the invoices. So I'm glad to hear that they can still do that. Um, you answer my questions. If we can just tell us what the outcome of your meeting is with the financial advisor so we know what our options are, that'd be great. Sure. Um, can I have a motion? Sure. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the interfund borrowing prepared by the Treasurer Collector in the amount of $1.2 million for the purposes of the construction of the new Senior Center and rehabilitation of the Veterans Memorial Gym, the Athletic Field Renovation Project, and the Cedar Point Project. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. Further discussion? Yep. Is there anyone on the phone lines? No, nope, we're done. Right. Okay, but they can still call in. Um, they could, but... Yeah. No one's yet. Great. Um, we'll have a roll call vote. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Great. That is unanimous as well. Moving right along, we are going to talk about the release of contingency funds for the library building project. Um, Nancy is going to handle that as well. And I know we have Jess on the phone. And is there somebody else? Maybe Stephen Shea. I don't know. No. Nope. Just Jess? Just Jesse and the board members. Okay. Yeah. Nancy, do you want to give us an overview? Under their, its control. 
for the finish of the um, ADA accessible walkway from the street, the crosswalk, across Grand Street to get to that walkway, and then the door controls uh, at the lower door. The only part of that project that's been able to be completed to date has been the door controls. We've had significant issues with the walkway itself, um, issues with the contractor, issues with the site, issues with the design, issues with it not being <laughs> compliant when it was um, framed out. I know it's been an uh, irritation to people that the crosswalk still hadn't been done, but we couldn't put a crosswalk in on branch if it led to nowhere. Um, so right now, uh, the DPW director, Kevin Cafferty, got involved about uh, a month ago uh, and has been very helpful and it is a subcontractor of the Athletics Fields Project who is actually now, um, who went over, gave the town um, a price and scoped it all out and is working on installing that walkway. If you've been over there, they have actually started work on the walkway. Um, with the uh, quote that we got for that uh, walkway, the difference uh, was about $6,000 and the DPW director was gonna make up the difference from what had already been released by the board for the project, for the walkway, um, with his road money because it would include the crosswalk across uh, Branch Street and the two crossings. That was great. Um, when the when they started to lay it out, they had um, the ADA coordinator, building commissioner Bob Hogue, will come out and take a look to make sure it was right. And they found other issues. And they also asked Jesse to come out and take a look as well, so that she could um, give her opinion on it. And she noted that there was an issue with drainage right by that back by the patio. So they were able to address that drainage. It was going to be fifteen hundred dollars to put in a drain to address the drainage of the patio. Again, great. Facilities department said, we can pick it up, we'll take care of that, everything's great. Um, but now that the walkway joins the patio, the patio has now become not ada compliant. Yeah, welcome to the wonderful world, it's just snowball. So when we had our ADA transition study done, our self-evaluation last year, the patio was not found to be an issue. It, there was no mention of it. Um, but now it is non-compliant. Um, and Bob Vogel went out, he also concluded that it is now not compliant. So in order to fix the patio to make it compliant with the walkway and everything else that's gone on, it is an additional fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars. <laughs> Can you tell us what it was that was not compliant? That what changed? Now, my understanding of it from um, Kevin and Bob is that now that that walkway connects to that patio, the patio is not compliant. Because it wasn't attended originally as... It, it didn't connect to anything, so it was fine on its own. But now it, it's not compliant. Whether we're going to have an issue with that as an access point, it remains to be seen. So in order for the patio to be made compliant, they literally have to take it up and relay it at least five feet of it. So that's why now it's come back before you, because of all the little speed bumps along the way, we managed it, we managed it, we managed it, and we don't have a place to come up with this difference. Mr. Chair, may I ask another follow-up? Yep. <laughs> um, when the original building was built and that patio was laid out, it was in conformity because it didn't have access. Is that accurate? It didn't go anywhere. So when you change the use, you have to change the compliance. You're connecting it to a handicap accessible walkway, so therefore it needs to also be handicap accessible. Okay. It has to meet the pitches and everything. Why is it connecting there? It's the only place to connect. Yeah. It can't go to the regular path and up to the front door? No, too steep. This is where it meets the grades. So where was it supposed to go? I think it connected down further but it didn't mean it was too steep. So they had to go further out and further up in order to meet the one and three. To connect it down lower into the sidewalk, the pitch doesn't work. That was part of the problem. They had it too short mm -hmm. connecting in and it was too steep. So now they have to go further out and further up to meet that slope. It can't connect to the back door of that conference room? It's not an entrance. That's an emergency exit. So where are you suggesting to get the money? Well, the library project still has over half a million dollars left in it that's under your control. Uh, so the question would be whether or not you want to release additional funds of that 250000 to finally finish the walkway and make it <laughs> ADA accessible now that it joins the patio. 
Um, and that was the last major piece of the blockery project that hadn't been done. Um, PBC has uh, mentioned it at every single meeting that they've had. It has been an ongoing issue of trying to get the walkway done and get the crosswalk down the branch route. The added bonus was the drainage will now be fixed in that area. Um, the other added bonus is this ADA issue will be addressed that we didn't have before, but we're all the punches. You will still have funds left over that the board will have to decide at a future time if it wants to move forward with the generator or not, and if it doesn't, uh, what it wants to do with the balance of those funds. Okay, I'll open it up to uh, the board members that are not here. Um, Sean? I could hear the NC a little bit better, but I did hear, I think I get the gist of it. <laughs> Does the architect have any skin in this game? The architect. This is a building that was there, that the elevations didn't change at all. There would have been architects in town that could have probably told you a walkway could not be constructed or if it was under, to make it ADA compatible. It's just, it's just a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. And then if we go forward with the generator, do they stand to profit from it at all? We're not discussing the generator now, but it's the. Um, I heard. I thought yeah. I just heard Nancy say something like that, though. I mean, yeah. I, I don't want them to. I don't want them to make a dime off if we if we do an option like that. That you know, a lot of architects, OPMs, they have, you know, money they stand to make off it. It's just so. this has been one of the most difficult projects that I've ever seen, and I hope the senior center doesn't follow <laughs> this 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 route. It would have been so much easier just to build a brand new library, a lot easier and probably cheaper in the long run. And I know all about the, you know, the grant, but it's so, it just it doesn't make sense. It's just very frustrating, as I'm sure it is to some others, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that's all. This is, not, this is not real difficult stuff, a, a, a walkway. You know, it's not much change there. So we don't have much choice, though. I saw them out working today, and who was that? Did, did Jim say it was a contractor from the field out back? One of the subcontractors, yeah. Right. And you know, who was who should have been doing it? Who was responsible for that? Was anyone responsible, Jim? And I know, Jim, you came into this so late. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, the the walkway right wasn't in the original project, Sean. It was something that uh, we had to add later when someone basically challenged us on it. There's been a lot of finger right, pointing right, back and well, forth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but rightfully so. Karen, so. Karen, Karen Canfield, you must share my frustrations. You've been <laughs> in this right from the very beginning, and, and, and every and everyone, but Karen, you're being right in the middle of it. It's just, just, I, I'll be so glad to see this project through. <laughs> a lot of people work very hard. Jess and, and some of those folks, you know, worked way beyond what what was what their normal job is to see this done, and all the volunteers and all that. But it's just a little frustrating. That's all. You know. I mean, it's frustrating, for Sean. I've only been there two years. It's frustrating for me. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth between the architect, between the contract, and between, and finally we said, "Look, get it marked out. We got it marked out. We found a contract. We said go fix it because uh, we just wanted to get it done." Right. And the contractor we have working yeah, on it. I know. Get it behind us. Yeah, the right. contractor doing the work, uh, the subcontractor with the athletic fields, his concrete work has been fantastic. So we knew we had a good contractor. And I'm sure it is. I just ho I hope this stuff. In a few years from now, you know, board members aren't <laughs> talking about these things with the senior center, you know. It's just, I hope, hope everyone's learned a little bit from this project. It's very difficult to remodel, you know, remodel something that's, that's already there. And that's, a, that's all I want to say. Okay. Uh, Karen Conley? Um, I share everyone's frustration. I'm sure everyone does. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I don't understand how the architects didn't know this. I, I don't get it. Um, but one question I have for Karen Canfield is, with the potential project, or is it a patio, what is it, uh, in the back of the library, are they taking into consideration these types of issues? And I think we'd all agree that handicapped access, accessibility is really important. So. I just don't want to see us in another situation where we build something and then after the fact find out that it's not accessible. Um, Karen, yes, so the what Ms. Um, Conley is referring to is there is a proposal to do a um, 
a garden, a, a patio in a garden behind the building um, as a tribute to uh, Michael Goulding and his family is working with Jesse, and I'm sure she can add more to it to figure that out. It has been laid out so that the access point is from the path from Cedar, um, the one that goes to Cedar, I mean to um, Central Park. Um, and ADA compliance has been factored into that accessibility. Um, so I don't know where it stands right now. Jesse can probably update us on that, but um, um, it was definitely in the conversation. And, and well, it is the I wish of the Goulding family, too. I, I think we so. thought we had architects who knew about that designing the renovation of the library. Right. But so as I guess my question is, is are, are, the, are architects and people like that, are they certified by anyone that they actually do know? I, I just find it hard to believe the prior architects didn't understand this. He did, and to Jim, to just if I may, Mr. Chair and Mr. Boudreau, um, the this question has been asked many times over the course of this because it does it does defy logic, um, and the architect has answered um, that in the original design they were not tasked with um, connectivity to the street because there's really you know the sidewalks across the street and it wasn't. It was not in their original. The entire building, what they were required to do, is ADA, ADA compliant, and they are certified, and they have to comply with the state regs on that. So unfortunately, it was not in their scope and not in their requirement. And to Sean Harris's point, I hope we've all learned from that lesson that maybe we should have included it in the scope and, um, and addressed it at the beginning. But now we're addressing it now. Well, might I say that I think it was up to the architect to ask us, do you want connectivity to the street? And I won't say anything more. Thank you. <coughs> Maura? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you. I, I concur. I have a question. I mean, I, I agree with Sean, and I agree with um, the sentiment that Mrs. Connolly brought up as well. But what I don't understand is why we don't have any recourse, because it sounds like this is strike. This is the third time we're trying to do this. Am I misunderstanding that? So I know the original scope wasn't there with the first architect. But then I thought they were charged to come back and design, <coughs> excuse me, a walkway that was ADA compliant. Is that what you're explaining now? <coughs> Sorry, is not ADA compliant? So we're bringing in a, a, another contractor to that's just yeah. awesome. No, we're, we're, here. we're making an ADA compliant walkway that is basically connecting to an area that is now not ADA compliant when you connect the walkway. All right, so the, the design of the ADA compliant walkway is correct, correct at this point. Appropriate. Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. It's just where it meets the patio, it sounds like. Right. Where was the previous design ah. supposed to go? Which previous Wasn't design? there a previous design for the walkway? Yeah, so if you, if you go up the hill, it came in mm -hmm. below. Right. But the problem with that was it was too truncated, so the slope was wrong. So it wasn't ADA compliant? The, the one that they originally laid out it wasn't was... wasn't compliant. He, right. They put the original yeah. one in, they started digging it, and we drove by and we sent Bob Vogel on. Bob Vogel said, that doesn't meet the slopes. Right. So it's really not... This isn't the plan that we really have the problems with. We have the plans with the, the problem with the plan that was not going to be ADA compliant to go up the driveway. Um, you know, and it's just the price of everything's outrageous. So now we're paying the patio probably didn't cost twenty thousand dollars to build, and now we're paying twenty thousand dollars to fix five feet of it. Um, I know everybody wants this to go away, but I mean, don't we have any recourse with this firm that designed the ADA compliant walkway that now isn't? <laughs> yeah, we usually don't win these battles. Yeah, I mean, those conversations aren't over, but we're in the process right now of just trying to finish this, and we can chase those later. But Jess, do you have anything to add? Um, yes. Can you can you guys hear me? We can. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can hear you, Jess? Okay. Um, yeah. I, you know what? I what I really don't understand um, is that 
uh, while the, we weren't connected to the street necessarily before, um, the path leading um, that sort of um, C-shaped path that leads um, from the lower level patio um, and connects to the main sidewalk, um, that, that was at least to that parking area with the, um, at the lower level across from the, the larger meeting room, that was always meant um, to be an ADA compliant path. So I am a little confused as to why the patio um, is, is not compliant. Uh, I mean, I certainly trust uh, Bob Vogel and all of the people that are working on this, but I am a little bit confused as to why the patio is, is not compliant now. Just that's a really good point because I sat in those meetings and uh, that's exactly right. The handicap spots on the lower part of the parking lot were approved as accessible because you could do the C path down to the lower patio. That's a really good point. But you still have to get up the hill to there. No, come, no, it come was from the other it, direction. Yeah. The new the new the new walkway is coming from the other direction. Right. It's coming from the field. Coming from the street up. Whereas you're going down and turning, if I'm, I mean, I'm trying to do this off yeah. my memory, you're coming yeah. off those parking spots, coming down and then turning in. You're not Correct. actually over in that part of the patio. Oh. You don't have to get up the hill. Right. The, the spots are already up the hill. You get that, Jess? Do you see that? I, I, I do. I yeah. do. Okay. But I think I her think point is now. that the patio should have been compliant because that was, that was the connector no matter which way you were coming from. Is that your point, Jess? Correct. Right. But now we have a new yeah. access point. It's a totally different access point. Yeah. You come from a totally thing. different direction. I know, but the patio itself, like we don't know why how the patio is not compliant. You know, if, is it is the door not big enough? Is the you know, those things should have been compliant because it was going to be used anyway. Anyways. It's how the patio joins the walkway. Right. It's where the patio comes into so the it's walkway. A new access point that and it caused it was not non compliant before. It's fine. Right. It's because of how the walkway but the, And it's gonna cost fifteen grand to fix that? The whole patio has to be redone. Uh, from the recommendations it was five feet of the patio had to be taken out and relayed to get the pitch correct. And to also correct the drainage problem. Well we're putting in a drain the drainage problem. Right. That's more expensive right. than a seawall. Which, which, is, which is really important. Yeah, the drainage is 1500 but the patio, five feet of patio is fifteen to $18,000. What? So, uh, <laughs> so I think what we want to... <laughs> yeah. Has, uh, has the Public outrageous. Building Commission reviewed this yet? I can't contain myself. That's outrageous. Um, I think I would feel comfortable having the PBC take a look at this before we decide to release the funds. Um, is that a problem, Jim? Yeah, From I mean, the contract is there. It's working now. Okay. Something's got to get done. Yeah, see, we wish we knew that the details. Because it just, uh, you know, if we're talking about a five-inch gap that has to be, you know, it's hard for us to fathom $18,000 going into the connector of a path to a compliant patio. Um, so it can can you just make sure that it's being reviewed yep. by Bob Vogel and that this is? Yeah, I know Bob's been out and looked at it. Kevin's been out there and looked yeah. at it. Um, I mean, I could go out there and look at it, but I'm not going to be able to tell you anything. It just looks yeah. like a path to me. But well, maybe someone can send us a notice to why the details of why it's not compliant. Yeah, there's no. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'd like to see the breakout. Yeah. But can I also I ask don't. One more question. Yes, mm -hmm. Sean. This patio that we're talking about, is this new? No. Or is, it, is this something we tried to save from the original library? Oh, no, it's new. It was created as part of this project. And the fact that we're bringing a, a walkway up to it makes it non-compliant, or was it non-compliant the way it is? The fact that you're bringing a walkway up to it. So the connection of the new walkway and the path and the patio right. is causing something. Right, and the reason they got it, they are going to have to zigzag this new walkway to, to get the correct pitch right. to make it correct.
Correct. Because you can't much, go up the driveway. Much like the Ju Jenkins School on First Parish Road. Exactly. Right. So, okay. So I don't want to hold up the project. Problem. Why don't we, um, does everyone feel comfortable moving forward, you know, with the, um, you know, contingency that, uh, you know, that someone's going to send us some details and we'll be able to read it and comment on it? Yes. <laughs> so this was um, Bob Vogel's uh, comments back to myself, uh, Jim, Jesse, and Kevin after going to the, the library to visit it. Um, Hello all, just visited the library, walkway is coming along fine, the crew from Argus doing an excellent job. Problem is with the paver plaza to which the walkway leads. The plaza slopes away from the building to lower right hand corner um, where I was told Argus is to install an area drain, which is a good idea. However, slope of plaza exceeds AAB maximum pathway cross slope of 2%. Depending on where measurement is taken, it is 3% to as much as 5%. To make the route access across the plaza from the end of the new walkway to the door compliant, a five foot wide swath of pavers will need to be all or partially reset with a cross slope of less than 2%. This is not such a difficult job as the pavers are embedded three to four feet, uh, excuse me, three to four inches of stone dust. It was suggested to the foreman that the edge of the pavers nearest the building be dropped rather than raising the edge farthest from the building. The drop will be on the order of a half an inch. Modifying the building side edge will allow a seamless transition back to the rest of the plaza, which can maintain its present slope. This would be additional work, a change order to the contract, and I think it should be done. Signed by law. And the cost estimate came from the contractor? It did. I don't have paperwork on the cost estimate because it's kind of like chicken and egg. Mm -hmm. I need the board to release funds so that when PPC meets again, which I think will be next Tuesday, they can take it up and have their discussion about it. As, um, it has been pointed out by the board members, they haven't had a chance to vote on it, but they can't take any action if no funds have been released to their um, control. So right now I have a change order for thirty-one thousand dollars. They got us the walkway, um, an ADA compliant walkway, and a crosswalk across branch. I do not have, I have not yet received a change order from the contractor for the drain um, okay. or the pavers. Okay. So I think, as Karen Canfield mentioned a minute ago, that we should put this back in the hands of the building committee and let them figure out. That's what they do. It's not what we do. Um, and they'll, the drain will be included in that, right? So it won't come out of Kevin's budget anymore? Correct. This, this would bring everything out of the library project to get it completely. Okay. So I would suggest that we that we release the money to the building, um, what's it called? The building, Public Building Commission. Public Building Committee, sorry. And then let them work out the details of the construction. Mm -hmm. So can I have a motion to release those funds? Yes. Uh, move to release the library project funds in the amount of $26,000 to complete the ADA walkway crosswalk at Brand Street, drain, and modification of the patio. Do you want to say pending? Second. Uh, I think that is a given. We're right? going to release the funds and then they're going to do, do better. Can I have a second from somebody on the second. phone? Second by Mr. Harris. Second. Further discussion? Anyone on the phone, Nancy? No one has called in. Great. All in favor of releasing the funds, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Mignani? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Reluctantly, yes. Ms. Curran? <laughs> Ms. Curran? Yes. Okay, that's unanimous, 5-0, and we'll let the Public Building Committee work out the details. Okay, the next topic um, is a discussion vote to amend the post-issuance uh, tax compliance procedures. So, Nancy, I'll let you explain the change in the okay, um, policies. Section, section uh, Rule 15C2-12 um, is an SEC rule. Um, it's amended to reflect Continuing disclosure to the marketplace about our finances. 
changed in February of 2019. The policy that we currently have that's an appendix of our financial policies does not reflect the changes that occurred in February 2019. Uh, Bond Council has recommended that we make the change. We were holding off because we were looking at um, revamping our financial policies based on some information we, uh, feedback we got from the credit rating agencies at our last conference call. But since we're going to be going back out to market, we should get this addressed, at least as part of it. So what's before you is to remove exhibits B and C, which is the post-issuance tax compliance procedures from our financial policies, and just accept separately um, post-issuance tax compliance procedures that was recommended by bond council. And the only two things that change, and the only thing that this does is that we have to reveal if we're having difficulties if we default on any debt um, and make a filing with Emma. Um, but the, the items that changed in February 2019 was if we had any incurrence of a financial obligation agreement or there was an event that reflected financial difficulties. So the only thing that we've had to report since this and we are in compliance um, was the bus lease because that is a major financial obligation. Um, and then we just send the information to our financial advisor who will show up to Emma for us. So anyone who's interested in buying or holds our uh, bonds is aware of it. So there's about a 25-page document here. This is this is going in, and you're taking out those B so and C. About 12 pages and putting in six. But this is the whole the one that we have in the packet here is. I gave you our entire financial policy. It's okay. only exhibit B right. and C of it that needs to be removed. Okay. M Mr. Um, Chair. Yes. May I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> I think it would be better if Nancy was at the mic up at the front. I she keeps cutting in and out. I'm finding it hard to follow. Sure. Um, Seth will get one for. Her. I agree, Karen. I apologize. I was social distancing for Michelle, but now that she has physically distanced herself, I will come closer to you. All right. So, uh, Nancy, yes. much better. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so all we're trying to do is just remove ex exhibit B and C of our financial policies that currently exist, which deal with post-issuance tax compliance, which is basically our disclosure to the marketplace of any of our finances, um, which is required by the SEC. And in its place, we want to adopt uh, tax compliance procedures um, that have been recommended for bond council, which incorporate the changes to Rule 15C212 that occurred in February 2019. And the bulk of those changes were uh, two items, such as um, disclosing major financial obligations. In our case, we have disclosed one, and that was the bus lease. You probably understood it better when she was in the back of the room. <laughs> Can I actually move closer? <laughs> the what? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, bus the school bus lease. School bus. Oh, the school bus leases. Thank you. Uh, I'll summarize it. Okay. We we have to do it, <laughs> and it's changing a couple of lines of our policy because the SEC changed their guidelines. Thank you. Uh, Sean, do you have any questions? No. Mora? Thank you. <laughs> I do not. Karen? No, I'm, that was a brilliant explanation. Can I have a motion from somebody? Yes. Move to strike Exhibit B and C of the town's financial policies relevant to the post-issuance tax compliance procedures and adopt the Bond Council recommended continuing disclosure procedures. Second by? Second. Ms. Conley, further discussion? Is there anyone on the phone lines? Hold on. <laughs> Surprisingly, no. <laughs> and we'll have a roll call vote. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, the next topic is a review and discussion on the speed limit on 3A. Jim? Uh, so just very briefly, it's in your packet. We received a an email from a resident who had sent it off to Mass DOT, asking for us to review the speed limit on Route 3A down there, Henry Bailey Turner, and uh, where else? Am I looking down there? Uh, basically, down works in the Booth Hill. Booth Hill. The Booth Hill works yeah. in the Cohasset. The speed limit drops precipitously going to Cohasset. He feels it should be the same speed limit on the Situate side. 
the board would have to request Mass DOT to do that uh, review. Normally, I would caution the board whenever someone comes out and does a traffic review, the speeds go up, not down. Uh, but in that case, I believe because of the way that road is uh, designated, I don't think it can go up. Uh, it could come down. I doubt it. But you would have to ask DOT to actually go out and do the traffic study. So do we really want it to? Are we happy with it? <laughs> I mean, just because this is just one citizen who wants to increase the speed limit going into Cohasset so you don't have to slow down there. No. If I could just add something. Yeah. I did double check with Ann since she was here a couple meetings ago giving you an update on the 3A project. Ann Burbine. 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 Okay. Burbine. To see if this came before her committee because they're working on the lights and intersections. Right. She said no, but this is something that they would want done also. Increase the speed limit. Decrease, Decrease the, speed. the speed limit. Well, I thought you said it slowed down going into Cohasset. It does. He she wants to slow down, to slow down on the Situate side. I get it. Okay. Well, I'm sure it'd be happy to increase on the Cohasset side, but that would be beyond us. So we're just trying to slow it down between the police station and the Cohasset line for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Okay. I think he wants it the other way, from Cohasset coming into Situate. Well, he wants, well, it's the same he wants stretch, that whole stretch. So I don't think he cares what direction it's going. He wants the speed reduced. Right, so you can go They're not going to have one speed going one way. All the way yep, from 3A going towards Situate Middle High School, all the way. That's what his request is. Right, but they're not going to have one speed going one way and one speed going the other. They're going to review the whole thing. Right. Understood. Okay. Does anyone have, uh, uh, Karen Conley, any comments on us requesting this study? Um, I guess I don't understand what possible ramifications there would could it go against us yes I, I oh, mean it can a lot of times when, when you do a speed study again it's based on average speeds in that area and a lot of times when you do it the speed goes up again I think what this road is designated at I think 50 is the speed limit I don't think it can go up higher than that um, I don't think right. they can make it 55 or 60 on that road because just the, what the designation of the road is so I think in this particular case there's not a whole lot of risk um, I'll tell you on a lot of other roads in town, if you want to do a speed study, because someone says 30 is not enough, it should be 25, it's going to end up being 40 by the time they're done. Right, right. Well, I guess I think that if we are already in the queue, in the plan to put a, a light at Henry Turner Bailey Road, then I think this is probably a waste of time, just my opinion. Okay. Uh, Sean? I, I agree with Karen. Couldn't agree more. Let's see what happens with Henry Turner Bailey Road. They're going to have to redesign that and then take it from there. If there is a full traffic light there, that will probably take care of it. Someone who's starting from a red light or having to slow down to a red light, it will probably correct itself. The re, you know, 35 miles an hour in Cohasset, you have business after business after business on both sides of the road. So there is a a need for that, that that's for sure now if they bring if they extend i remember when ian came in before us and if they extend that double lane north and south further south then then it might be an issue where you, you know everyone knows what i'm talking about mm -hmm. the lane drop in front of the rockland trust um where you go from two to one when you're going especially south everyone's in a race to get in front of one another, they're ha ha traveling south. So I'd like to see what they come up with for Henry Turner Bailey before I support anything else, any change. Thank you. Maura? Um, hmm. I understand the position of my fellow board members in waiting to see. I, I do think the light there at Henry Turner Bailey might slow folks down to begin with a little bit. Um, Given a choice, I'd rather fight for a light at Manlot, to be honest with you. I know how the DOT can get tired of multiple requests from towns, and um, I'm okay with waiting and seeing what the Henry Turner Bailey Road uh, reconstruction does, and honestly, I'd, I'd love us to focus more on Manlot and uh, 3A. I know it's a whole different issue, but I think it's one that we need to start taking a look at a little bit more closely. Karen? Um, I think Lorraine might have a point that if they, I think, Jim, won't they be, be required to do a, a speed study to evaluate the light as part of that process anyway? 
Not necessarily. That could already have been done, uh, but not for a speed study, just to see what the speeds of the traffic counts are, and now look at it to change the speed, if that makes sense. It does make sense, actually, yeah. They're evaluating it for the light. I understand what the board's position. I mean, I think the worst that could happen is if you say, we'd like you to do it, Mass DOT might say, we're not going to do it because we're going to put a light in there anyways. Yeah. Um, I, but. I, I think that there's enough problems on that stretch that I wouldn't mind. I mean, that the, the cost is borne by Mass DOT if they agree, right? They do it, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's two different things going on. I, I don't think it's a bad idea given how much has changed on that road since I moved here. <laughs> But okay. um, great. I, I don't see a problem in doing a study on it if, if the Mass DOT wants to do it. Um, you know, as Sean and Karen po pointed out, it may be done anyways, and the whole thing may change with that light there. Um, so um, I'll take a motion from somebody, <laughs> or no motion. It seems like Karen and Sean want to wait. Maura, do you want to wait or go ahead with this, or are you? No, I'm fine with going ahead with it. Um, I understand. Let's just see what they say. Maybe they'll come back and tell us that it is included in the mm -hmm. reevaluation of Henry Turner Bailey. Um, uh, Jim, is there any chance that we would they would review it and they would say that? the town would incur an expense to put additional signage or anything else up on that road? It's not our road. Mm -mm. Okay. State road. All right, so uh, does someone want to make a motion? Um, I move that the Board of Selectmen direct the Town of Situate Administrator to um, request District 5 Traffic Operations Section will perform a preliminary radar check to, to determine in the area to determine um, if actual speeds justify a change to the posted speed limit um, as outlined in the letter from Mass DOT. Second by? Second. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. Further discussion? Nancy, is there anyone on the phone? There's not. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Roll, roll oh, call. Roll call. Well, who seconded? Second by Ms. Curran. Mr. Yes. Correct. Mr. Harris? I'm opposed. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ms. Conley? Opposed. And Ms. Curran? Yes. Ms. Canfield? And Ms. Canfield? Yes. Tiebreaker. Okay, so that passes three to two. Okay, moving right along, we will discuss the uh, change of date for the annual and special town meetings. Um, Jim, you want to review so that? So all that's in here for the board is a resolution uh, in support of the moderator's decision, the moderator under the new statute, voted to postpone town meeting because of the public health emergency until May 11th. 11th. Um, and there's just a resolution in here asking the board to support that postponement. So the governor allowed uh, moderators to actually the governor didn't allow it. the moderator's moderator is allowed to postpone town meeting by 30 days and that's what he's chosen to do um, the existing statute said that the moderator could postpone town meeting for a public safety emergency um, there was some concern among the moderators association that public safety emergency wouldn't cover this so they changed the statute to say public safety or public health emergency so the moderator in consultation with the board of selectmen the chief election officer of the town and the chief administrative officer of the town then can make a decision and postpone town meeting for up to 30 days which he did the other day he used those powers this is just having the board of selectmen weigh in and say yes we support that change of date okay and then we'll see what happens in the next 30 days we can only do it for 30 days so we did it as far out as we could and then we'll see what's occurring uh, before that okay um, any discussion before the clerk reads it? That answered my question, Tony. Okay. All right, Karen? 
Whereas the moderator, situate moderator has consulted with the situate board of selectmen and the public safety and health officials concerning situate's 2020 town meeting, and whereas the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts issued an executive order on March 12, 2020, declaring a state of emergency exists in the Commonwealth, and whereas there are multiple public health and safety recommendations to practice social distancing between individuals in order to protect public health due to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas the moderator has determined it is necessary to recess and continue the town of Situate's 2020 annual town meeting. Therefore, it is moved that the board, Situate Board of Selectmen support the moderator's declaration and the recess and continuation of the town of Situate's 2020 annual town meeting until May 11, 2020, 7 p.m. at the Situate uh, High School Gymnasium. Second by? Second. Second. Mr. Harris, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Mignotti? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Carmen? Yes. Great. Um, on the same line, or the next item is a discussion vote. Um, Nancy, can you just make sure there's no one on the line? None? No, no. Great, thank you. Um, discussion vote uh, for the change of date for the annual town election to June 13th, 2020. So the original town election under the bylaw would have been Memorial Day weekend. The board voted to file special legislation with the state to allow the town of Situate to change our election date because of that anomaly. That legislation is somewhere in the legislative process now, abandoned and forgotten in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, the legislature, the legislature has passed and the governor has signed a bill that allows boards of selectmen in any town uh, it also allows cities, but cities don't have the same election cycle, so it really just applies to us at this point. Um, and any time, by a vote of the Board of Selectmen to just change the election date. So all we're doing is doing what we've already done, but under the new authority from the new statute. So the Board would just vote to change the election date to June 13th, which, again, you've already done. We just didn't have permission from the state to do it. Great. So we now have permission from the state to change it through th this methodology. <coughs> Um, any questions, uh, Sean? No. Karen Conley? No, thank you. Mora? No. Great. Can I have a, uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll take I a do motion. Not. I move that the Board of Selectmen postpone the Town of Situate election until June 13th, 2020. Second by? Second. Ms. Conley? Oh. Just, just to let you know, remind you. Say it again. You have to abstain. All right. Okay, so we'll, we'll do a roll call vote. Okay, motion by Ms. Conley and second by Ms. Conley? Ms. Canfield. Ms. Canfield. Oh. Not me. <laughs> K1. Oh, sorry. Okay, Mr. Vignani? I abstain. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Great. So the final vote is four to zero with one abstention. I have to abstain because I am actually on the ballot running for re-election. So, um, so that passes four to zero. Um, the next uh, topics for our meeting are other business. Um, I know most of the committees aren't meeting now. Does anyone have any liaison reports? Not for me. Anyone? Sean, do you have any? No. Karen Conley? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Karen who? You. Con Karen Conley? <laughs> Yo, you. I do. Um, I just want to report that the school uh, superintendent uh, search committee uh, has concluded its uh, review. We reviewed 25 candidates for the superintendent position. We interviewed eight candidates, um, two of, six of whom we interviewed via Zoom. And we sent three candidates to the school committee. Um, and this week, Three, the three interviews will happen via Zoom. It's not the most, um, it, it's not the best way to interview, but it actually worked for the committee. So I will let the community know that in alphabetical order, the uh, three candidates sent forward to the school committee were, and the first interview happened tonight, William E. Burkhead, principal of Montemoy High School, very impressive resume. 
uh, James T. Mealy, uh, Doctor of Education, Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations in North Andover, also an impressive resume. And Andrew G. Stevens, uh, Doctor of, uh, he has his Doctor of um, Education as well, currently the principal at Lexington High School, and he um, was also the principal of Duxbury High School and was a finalist in the last round of um, uh, superintendent candidates three years ago. So the committee did a job. It wasn't easy, but they made it work. And I just want to thank all my fellow members of the committee for all their hard work. Great. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for sitting on that for us. That is a, a lot of work. I was happy to do it. Great. Maura, do you have any liaisons? Um, I just have one. Uh, Tim and I spoke today about Ship Shape Day. Mm -hmm. um, so I reached out to the Beautification Commission because they had asked me about what our thoughts were. Um, and in consulting with Drew and Jim, we're suggesting that it get postponed um, until Drew and Jim give us, you know, be all clear where it makes more sense for us, where we have the resources from DPW as well as where it makes more sense for us as a community to get out there together and, and clean up our streets. So just wanted to share that. I don't have a date. Uh, none of us do because I know the Beautification Commission needs to work through that. and and figure out a new date to suggest. Great. Nothing for me? And I don't have anything either. Great. Um, correspondence, there's, there's no, none. no correspondence as well. Um, do we have approval of some uh, meeting minutes? Uh, move to accept the meeting minutes for the Board of Selectmen meeting held on March 24th, 2020. Second by? Second. Ms. Curran? Further discussion? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Vignani? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Ms. Canfield? Yes. Ms. Conley? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. That is unanimous. Great. And uh, lastly, um, any other comments before we adjourn? No. Can Great. I just make one comment? Yes. I, we said it at the Thank top. Thank you very much to everyone. We said at the top of the meeting, and I think it's worth repeating, is our town employees have been working so hard, um, especially Mr. Bedro's leadership, to um, to get the town, keep the town running, and to address all of the new concerns. And I just wanted to reiterate that um, it's been just heroic work, and and thank you. Yes. Back in that. Well said. Yeah, that's that's unanimous. Um, you know, we've we've all been in town hall a little bit, and we've seen, um, you know, everybody coming in here and working so hard, and and um, you know, there's tape on the on the floors that show the social distancing. But it is, it is, a scary maybe too strong of a word, but it is definitely stressful. So thank you for uh, keeping our town running, everybody. Um, that being said, can I have a motion to adjourn and sign documents? So moved. Second by Second. Ms. Curran. Roll call vote for that. Uh, Mr. Vignani. Yes. Mr. Harris. Yes. Ms. Campbell. Yes. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Great. That's unanimous as well. Thank you, everybody. Please listen to the rules this Good week. Everyone. And Good hopefully this uh, will pass Thanks. quickly. Be Good healthy. Night. Thank you. Bye, guys.